All right, welcome, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you happen to be. This is Guru Session number 21, Dance Tech Archaeology with yours truly, Mark Caniglio. So I'm wearing an appropriate costume today. I have to stand up a little bit for you because that is the logo of Troika Ranch, the dance company that I co-founded with Don Stapiello in uh, 1994 and that we co-directed for a long time in New York City and also Los Angeles because a lot of what we're talking about, well, everything we're talking about has to do with that group. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some rather, by modern standards, ancient technology that we created to be able to do the pieces that we made. And this goes all the way back, actually, as far back as 1989, but most of the stuff that you're gonna see is actually created in the 90s and the zeros, yeah? And um, the reason that this session came about was I was planning to have this session anyway, but I just returned from Portland, Oregon, where I was with Don Stapiello, the choreographer of Troika Ranch, and the purpose for my trip was to go and photographically document all of this old gear, all of which was created by hand, by me. I built all this stuff and soldered it and all that sort of thing. So we would have a record for it and we could also document it on our website. But what I'm hoping is that in seeing some of this old stuff, uh, you'll actually be inspired because we're going to show little excerpts of the works in which they were used as well and that you'll get some inspiration from this because in the end, while this isn't specifically about Isadora, all of this stuff, a lot of it was even pre-Isadora, but it developed my need to create Isadora. It's why I created Isadora was to work with all this stuff, yeah? So, checking out, no one said that you couldn't hear me, so I assume you can hear me. I'm also going to be doing some audio coming from the computer itself. Please uh, let me know if for some reason you can't hear that either, yeah? And I'll be looking over from time to time for questions as we go along and look at this. Please tag me with the at sign Troikatronics. That gives a little colored badge, so I'll make sure to see it, yeah? Okay, so I think we're ready to begin. And uh, so if I remember my my keyboard commands here. Now let's do that. So let's start. And the first thing I want to show you goes back to 1994. Now in 1994 we did a premiered a piece that kind of put us on the map a bit called In Plane. This uses the MIDI dancer sensory system which we're going to talk about at the very end of the presentation today. But we wanted to be able to interactively control video. But in 1994 on a computer, all you could do was play a video about that big, kind of a postage stamp. You couldn't play full resolution video or anything like that. So what are we gonna do? But we, we wanted to be able to do this. So the solution was this combo, okay? What you see in front of you on the bottom is a Pioneer professional laser disc player. And this particular laser disc player has a sort of interesting history. Uh, well, let me tell you what it is first because many of you won't know what it is. So it actually was a disc. It looked like a CD, right? except instead of being this big, it was 12 inches in diameter like a vinyl record. And this could put about a half an hour of video on there. And the thing that was really interesting about this device was that you could jump to any frame on the disc it, didn't, it wasn't instantaneous and it depended, you know, if you had to jump from the outside of the disc to the inside, it would actually take a full quarter of a second. But if you were jumping to nearby parts of the physical medium, it could be faster. And, but you could also play the video forward or backward, anywhere from zero to twice normal speed, yeah? So this was our way to have high resolution, high meaning probably 640 by 480, but to have a higher resolution video and to control it. And the interesting history part about this laser disc player, it in fact came from Skywalker Ranch because uh, George Lucas, when they were making Star Wars in the early days, created this crazy edit system called, if I remember right, Edit Droid. And there were banks of these uh, laser disc players. So they take all the raw footage and they copy it onto the laser disc player and they made an electronic system for doing editing. So. Eventually, of course, they retired that when they could start doing it um, in more modern ways, more digital ways. And so there were 
I don't know, a few hundred of these laser disc players. And so, yeah, this particular laser disc player once lived at the Skywalker Ranch production studio. So, but here's the thing, right? It, the, the input to this, the way in which you controlled it was through an RS-232 uh, serial interface and that wasn't something so easy to deal with because in those days and really for everything you're going to see today MIDI was the communication protocol that we use meaning musical instrument digital interface the interface that's used to uh, communicate between musical instruments originally but you could use it to do all kinds of things so I want to zoom in here for a second on this box so on this box you're going to see what you see is a MIDI I.O. board, and you'll see better pictures of this device later, a 68HC11 microcontroller, which is kind of like an Arduino or the precursor to an Arduino. And I program that to accept MIDI commands and translate them into RS-232 to control the laser disc so that everything was in the world of MIDI, yeah? Because the MIDI dancer system that was the sensor was also coming in as MIDI, yeah? So, for example, it was the way you jump to a frame was you sent a pitch bend command. That's because in MIDI, the pitch bend command has the highest resolution. It's 14 bits, so it's like 16,384 or something like that is the maximum number. But that would cover all the frames of the disk. So you just send a pitch bend command and it would jump. And then using a continuous controller MIDI command, I could set the speed and the direction. Yeah. So this is how we were able to control um, you know, interactive video. So let me just give you a little taste of this. Now, unfortunately, um, all of these old videos are really dark. So what I'm going to do right now as we go along, I'm going to get the link for this and I'm going to post it into the chat over here so that later if you want to watch it on your own computer, because of course it's not going to look so good uh, on this computer either, you will have the link for all of these things that I'm showing you today and you can jump directly to them and see them. But let's just take a brief look here. Let me go back to Safari. Yeah, so now I need to change to preset number five, I believe. Yes, and then we're gonna go back to here. And so let me play a little bit. Hopefully, uh, I'll check. I wanna make sure you can hear the sound. So here we go. Okay, play. <laughs> folks just trying to find there we go okay so that was a little segment of in plane but hopefully you could see the way that the video was actually you know jumping from one spot to the other as this went along and um, uh, and actually it's looking for very specific things when Dawn got down on her hands or her knees there and held still the stillness for two seconds would cause it jump to the there was a particular sequence that went and so now it plays that sequence and she sits and watches it and then as soon as she jumps up you see her stand up and all of her limbs become straight that was the trigger to jump to the next sequence where she actually dances in unison with her own video image yeah so yeah that is the pioneer laser disc player midi controllable pioneer laser disc player which was how we were doing interactive video uh, yeah, coming up on 20 years ago. So that was a really important thing that we were able to do though because I, of course I wanted to be able to control it perfectly and this was a moment when already I started dreaming of being able to do this with a computer which is again why Isadora exists. Okay, um, uh, I'm just looking over at the chat real quick. Okay, no big questions 
blustery day in Australia. Hello. I always never know how to say your name. Tlock, Tlock, Tlock. I'm sorry. Anyway, good to see you and Sammy too and, and everybody else. Okay. So that's the first item on the list. Let's go to the next thing. So the other thing that I was really interested in is like, how could we bring objects to life? Yeah. And for this, this is also the first one we're going to look at is also in plane. This is really hard to see in the video. I'm going to play you a clip, but it's very, very difficult uh, to see. But anyway, I wanted to be able in in plane. It was like I didn't want to just have or Dawn and I did not want to just have the video stuck in one place that seemed boring to us and we wanted also it was important for the concept of the piece that the video could somehow move yeah so in the end i decided to make basically a little railroad a platform on which the projector could move and have a way of computer controlling that and that's what you're seeing here okay so there's a few things in this picture the silver box in the middle is another one of these boxes with a 68HC11 controller in it that accepts MIDI. But this one was programmed differently. You can see the little ribbon cable going to the circuit board over there. That's a very powerful stepper motor controller. And so by sending little pulses through those four wires, you could make the stepper motor go one way or the other way. And by pulsing it faster, it went faster. And pulsing it slower, it went slower. Um, now, I, if our friend, uh, our longtime Isidore user Gurchin were here, he would tell you that servo motors are much better. And I guess if I was to go back and do it again, I would use servo motors because it is difficult with the stepper motors. The acceleration is really tricky, but it basically, it worked, yeah? And to let you see the whole system, oh, well, there's another picture. There's the 68HC11 on the left in the blue circuit board and the, and the MIDI IO and then this uh, stepper motor controller board. But here's the whole system. Now, there's, the rope is missing, but you can see the motor on the left with the pulley, and then this platform, which I'll show a different picture in a moment to make that clear, but you see that there's two little turnbuckles on there, and then a pulley on the other side. What's missing here is that there was 24 foot feet of L-shaped aluminum track, and those uh, wheels that you see on the little um, platform rested on those, on those tracks, right? So if you can imagine a rope going to that turnbuckle, going over to the pulley and then to the other turnbuckle, you can see that by rotating the motor, it's going to move this platform left and right. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so that was the system. Yeah. And here's the, here's the actual platform there. Very beautifully done. You can see it was uh, completely handcrafted out of the thing. I think it's important to note is that too, I mean, we were really poor. I mean, this was like, this was, a, this was a lot of money for us to spend and we did the best that we could, but I had to fashion everything from scratch because, you know, two reasons. One, we, we really didn't have a lot of money to spend. And two, none of this stuff existed. That's the other part of the whole story of this talk is that, you know, in those days, these things didn't exist. Now there are many different kinds of solutions you might be able to get ready-made, but we had to make all of these things ourselves. yeah? So, um, here's the, oh, well, I went too far. We'll just wait for that one. So, Let's take a look though. Again, you're not going to be able to see this very well, but I'm going to show you and I'll find the link here. Okay, so I'm going to paste this into the chat. Uh, Sammy, I see your comment there about it should be in a media art museum. Um, you know, we were going to give this stuff away. If you know someone in Portland, Oregon who wants some of these things, like for instance, that motor controller I just showed you, you can write me immediately. And if Dawn hasn't, get the, she had a plan for where to go with it. But if you really want this stuff and you can, someone can pick it up in person, we will not ship it to you. But if someone wants this stuff, you can write me and I'll see what we can do. All right, that's, there you go. But just to say also to answer your question, Sammy, the MIDI dancer system, which I said we'll get to at the end, I actually wrote the, there's a museum of musical instruments here in Berlin, and I wrote them and offered them one of the MIDI dancers in case they might want it. I don't know if they would, but I've made the offer because that if, for, for me is maybe the most special of all the things we made. Okay, so you've got the link, but let's play a little bit. It's gonna be so dark old documentation 
Oh wait, I have to switch to my other thing. Hold on. Okay, here we go. And play. So, if you watch, at the bottom of the screen, there's a little white dot. You can see the little white... The little white dot moving. And now, in a minute, it's really going to haul ass across the stage. Okay, so hopefully, let's check my view here. Um, no, four. Okay, so hopefully you could see that a little bit. I know that um, it's super dark and I regret now, I wish I could go back in time and actually document that thing moving around and really get a good image of it. But the main point was that it really was like, the idea was that this video image was the, the doppelganger, the, the virtual dawn that existed not in real space, but was locked in plane, the plane of the back wall. That's why the piece is called in plane. And we, but I, we wanted that motion because you see it's almost chasing her at the end. The music gets super intense and it's almost like she's, it's chasing her around the stage. And so this was to set up the drama and the dynamic of what it was that piece was all about. So that was the first foray into this, um, uh, this kind of like robotic control. Again, all done with MIDI. Pitch bend, again, because the highest resolution, that was where do I want the platform to be? And then there were two other parameters. There was the, um, uh, and you see this also on the next one I'm about to show, it has the speed, that's the motor speed, but also the acceleration. You had to control the acceleration very precisely because if you accelerated too much, um, it would actually skip and jump and make an ugly kind of movement. So the, you would have to control both those parameters, the acceleration of the motors as it went from zero to whatever speed, but then the actual speed that you desired as well. Yeah? Let's see. Um, I see a question. All of this gear looks very well used. Did you do a lot of repurposing of the elements? No, I, we really didn't. I mean, it looks well used because some of it traveled around and some of it kind of just got banged around being moved to rehearsal. I mean, one of the most important things I think that Troika Ranch did that made our pieces successful was we took the, we took our equipment to rehearsal every time. I mean, when we were in New York City, we were at rehearsal studios and this stuff is heavy, especially these motor controllers. The transformers are massive and they really weigh a lot. But we took, we carried that stuff on our backs and in carts to rehearsal every single time because setting it up and tearing it down, practicing that process was super important. Two, we weren't like three days from a show and finding out that something actually didn't work. We found that out months, if not or weeks, if not months before we got to the show. So if you see wear and tear, it's mostly from hauling it around in backpacks and in carts in New York City as we prepared the pieces actually. Um, uh, and um, so, Anyway, that's why they look that way. Also, you know, they're just kind of like, I mean, they're all handmade. You know, I, I crafted this myself and they're just these aluminum boxes. They kind of scratch easily as well. Um, okay, so um, that was that controller. But I love that we could do this. I love seeing this thing move and, and knowing that Dawn's movement was choosing when it would move and to control it, this felt very powerful to me. So I expanded on this idea using basically exactly the same program, the little program that I wrote, which all of this, by the way, was written in assembler. It's like really hardcore, low level coding, right? Uh, really old school. But all of this HC11 stuff, I just took the same program and I kind of made it so I could run three motors with one controller. And that's what you're seeing in front of you right now. Um, uh, 
is a, a three-channel system, same exact idea, a different board because it actually could control three motors, not as powerful as the other one. I mean, that had to move a whole video projector, so that was pretty heavy. What you'll see in a minute, what these motors had to move was not so heavy, so this could be a little bit less powerful. But, so this is exactly the same. There's nothing really different, just multiplied by three. But here's the different part. So I wish I had a better picture of this up in the grid so you could see it. But what you have to imagine, these are two motors. Though, yes, those are seven inch plastic quarter inch tape reels that I repurposed to do this. So the motors are attached to the reels and then on the reels is a thin piece of wire. And the two white objects you see at the bottom, those attach to a fluorescent light tube, like a six foot or two meter fluorescent light tube, yeah? So given that this wire actually carried the power, you're gonna see that in a minute, carried the power for the fluorescent light, I could make either end go up or down so I could tilt the light or go like this or it could go up like straight up and down by moving the motors in coordination with each other, yeah? The, the really um, absolutely frightening part of this <laughs> thing, so if you look carefully, you see on the wood there are two wires and they are touching a, a piece of copper pipe which is on a piece of wood. Notice that that's wood going to the motor there. So that copper pipe is attached to the wire that is wrapped around the reel going down to the fluorescent light. In other words, this is what was up in the grid. That was absolutely bare. The, the electricity coming from the ballast that ran the fluorescent lights, that was just sitting there with those wires touching it. And I, <laughs> I don't know, nobody ever asked us any questions, but probably that isn't exactly safe. But in any case, so the, the power flowed from these electronic ballasts that you need to do the fluorescent lights through this wire going, the green wire you see to the, to the, um, the, the, the pieces of uh, spring wire there that are touching the copper, through the copper into the long wire that goes down to the light, yeah? So that's, and I can't remember if I have another picture of that. Let me just look. No, we're up to the next thing. Okay, so let's take a look at that in action. This was such a beautiful thing, and I'm kind of sorry that I didn't, I was saying today to Professor Woland that I was kind of sorry that I didn't pursue this more or make a bigger piece with it because um, we all know that later you've probably all seen things like the BMW thing where there's all these wires coming down and these balls and they make the whole thing move. It's a whole room full of basically what I made here. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of sorry that I didn't continue. But here's the clip. I'm putting that into the chat. And now I will go over here, paste it in here. Let's switch our view on what we're looking at here. And we should be able to see this. <laughs> there for a minute but um, 
that's a really that turned that piece was a really beautiful piece i encourage you to watch the entire thing and i should say the names by the way it's obvious so far i think all we've seen is don stop yellow but that dancer is sandy tillett who was in troika ranch in the early days with us and uh, she performed that solo. I mean, it was interesting because that wasn't, I, I have to admit, it wasn't really interactive. It was my idea to have the MIDI dancer control that. But in the end, it, it was kind of too unreliable. Again, these acceleration things I was talking about, the, the motors would skip and, and it would like make the things jiggle in a kind of ugly way. So there really wasn't an interactive control. I was simply watching Sandy. I knew the choreography and I knew where the light should move with her. But it's like the moment when she like, when they, the three lights come down and she just does this thing and they all tilt. Oh man, that's something that really uh, is nice for me. And also that happens to be, you know, we, a lot of, a. Uh, 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 a lot of people don't know that I wrote all the music for Troika Ranch, and that particular piece of music is one of my favorites, actually, so that's fun to hear also. So that was the um, motor control stuff, and again, um, using MIDI for everything, sending the MIDI commands, everything that you saw, the control, the way it moved, it's all just MIDI commands going to that control box and telling it what to do, yeah? Um, okay, so yeah, that was... Um, and that was 1999. I, I'm putting the year, it has the name of the piece and the year, or that's 2000, I guess. So also, Isadora doesn't yet exist for that piece. Isadora, I've done the drawings, I've actually started programming it, but it's not ready for use yet, right? But I've actually started to code Isadora at that point, which is 20, 22 years ago now, right? So. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of a nice marker because I was still using my old software, Interactor, which I created with my teacher, Morton Zabotnik. Okay, so that is the stuff with robotic control. Another thing that we did was to be able to do live video, something I think all of us have probably tried by now because these days you can just put NDI on your phone and get it. But this object, this is one of the ones I saved and brought back with me. I'm gonna grab it here. So, this is the, the uh, colloquial name for this is Sandy Cam. And here is, let me go to the full view for, so you can see it. So this is the camera, yeah? Little black box with a lens. There's actually a lens cap on it. If you can, it's a little dark to see, but maybe you can see the reflection of the lens. And so there's that. And then there's also a transmitter, which I, I'll have a picture of it. I forgot to bring it. That goes here. And then this belt, which has eight AA batteries. Now, the thing that was fun about this device, so, okay, so we wanted to have, we wanted the dancer to have video coming from where she was at on stage. Remember, now we're going back again. This is 1996 now. This is a piece called Vera's Body. Of course, there's no Wi-Fi, that doesn't even exist yet. I'm flipped like a grandpa, aren't I? It's like, ah, there's no Wi-Fi. But anyway, there's, it didn't exist. So how do we do that? So I discovered this company back then called Super Circuits. They had all kind of spy gear. Like that's where I got the camera too, yeah? They had all this kind of different spy gear stuff. And the cool thing was, now in the United States, it's legal for anyone to broadcast anything they want up to 100 milliwatts of power. That's the legal limit. So if you want to have a tiny little pirate radio station, you can do that and you would not, no one would be able to prosecute you for broadcasting because of that limit. But the kind of under the table thing about this super circuits company, the transmitters they sold were actually one full watt. So in other words, 10 times the legal limit. And so that's also why you had to have eight AA batteries because it would chow on batteries like crazy. But the thing that was great about this was that it actually was super powerful, therefore super reliable, even on a big stage, right? So these transmitters were kind of awesome. And I don't know if that company ever got in trouble with the FCC because of this, but I bought like three transmitters because I figured somehow they have to stop selling them. And I used them in several pieces. But the other side of the story that's interesting, so then, okay, how do you receive this? Well, and I, I wanted to demonstrate this today, but I could not find the key thing I needed. 
The way they did this was that instead of transmitting, uh, they, instead of transmitting on the normal TV channel range, like terrestrial TV, like channel two, three, four, six through thirteen, whatever, yeah. In those days, cable television existed, and you'd get cable, and you'd plug it into your VCR, and the VCR would be able to tune to the cable frequencies, which started at 20, I think, and went up to 108 or something. And those frequencies were different in a different range than the terrestrial broadcast frequencies. So this transmitter on this guy, the, the one watt that it's transmitting, transmitted a television signal, a normal television signal, on channel cable channel 59. So to get this to work, and I don't have a picture of this because I just don't have it, that's the missing element, you needed a VCR that accepted ca those cable channels, but instead of plugging a cable into it, you just plug a rabbit ear antenna, like the old fashioned, you know, antennas like this, and plug it in the back, and that's what would receive this, yeah? So here's a picture, and uh, let's go to the other view. Oh, wrong view. There we go. So this is a picture of the Sandy Cam here. And just like I just so showed you, so you saw that just now. Uh, the coloring, by the way, is blue because you'll see in a minute that Sandy, uh, it's again Sandy Tillett, the dancer who's performing this. Her costume is blue and that was to kind of disguise it a little bit and hide it. It's also useful to say that, um, you know, I built this stuff, but all of it was conceived by Don and me together. It was because we had a dramaturgical need for the piece and we wanted to do something. But I also must credit everything you see that's fabric, that was Don. Don made all of that stuff. And that actually, for the MIDI dancer, becomes really important when we get down the road and, and look at the MIDI dancer. Yeah? Just going to look at the chat briefly. Uh, what was sending the MIDI commands to the controlled? Uh, Christopher, you asked what was sending the MIDI commands to the control. Do you remember? You mean to the um, to the light sculpture? If you mean to the light sculpture, I think that maybe that's what you mean. Um, uh, my software Interactor, which was the is kind of the father of Isadora, which I created when I was at CalArts and kept building and improving, and that was under the auspices of my teacher and mentor Morton Sabotnik. We kind of. It was his idea first and then it became kind of more and more mine as I added different ideas of my own to it. But that's the software that was used to control the light sculpture with the software called Interactor. So yeah, so anyway, that's the answer to your question. So it was, a, it was running on an old fashioned G3 black Mac power book and this Interactor software would send the MIDI commands necessary to do the various parts of the choreography of those three lights. Okay, going back to Sandy Cam here. So, um, so yeah, that's Sandy Cam. That's what it looks like. And then we'll get to that one in a second. But let's take a look at uh, how that looked in the piece. Um, okay, going to my... Okay. And obviously, it's just a bit of a joke, you know. I mean, we, we, it's not... We never credited it in the program as Sandy Cam, but you know, it's like we called this we called the solo Sandy Cam because you know it was a cam and it was Sandy dancing. So here's the link that we're going to play here in a moment, and here we go. Okay, calling that up. Do the switch here, and place my body is not it's interesting to see here the dancers the screen was actually 20 different individual triangles with different colors and the dancers are rotating those triangles to make them white i'm actually going to go back and let you see that again um, i hope you can still hear me at the same time so you see there's just a strip of white this is because we couldn't do projection mapping, but what we could do is have a screen with different elements, red, black, and white, and by making the, some of the elements black, we could make just like a single strip, right? But now here, if you watch, as the dance in a bit here, the dancers, as they come around, are gonna run up stage, and they're gonna rotate all of these triangular-shaped objects to make them white so that you can see the full video image. All right, here they go. And so you can see uh, the camera is in Sandy's left hand. And the thing that I think is remarkable about this is this was such an incredible collaboration of, between uh, Dawn and Sandy. But Dawn 
she really choreographed every single move that you're seeing in the camera. It was not just a choreography for the body, but it was a choreography for the camera, and that's what makes this piece work. Okay, that's, um, uh, that's that for now. I encourage you to watch the whole thing. It's a, it's a, really, nice, um, it's a really nice section, this one. And uh, uh, also, another FYI about the stuff, we are, Don will also announce all the costumes you're seeing. Those costumes were beautiful. Those are some of the best, one of the nicest sets of costumes we had for any Troika Ranch piece. Those are also going to be av made available. There's going to be a day that Dawn will pick. And if you're in Portland and you need some costumes, you want to repurpose them, you can go over to her house and she's going to lay them on the ground and first come, first serve. So I can post a link somewhere, I think, where you can find out that information. I'll, I'll post it in the forum uh, when that moment comes, just in case you or someone you know is in Portland and would like to have some costumes, okay? Okay. Oh, really good point. Low latency, zero latency. Actually, that's the beauty of television, right? I mean, it's a real radio signal. And that's also true of the MIDI dancer system, right? Um, it's also using radio. You'll see that in a minute. But yeah, you have zero latency. I mean, yes, there's a little bit of latency now that it goes into the computer. But in this case, in that piece, again, this is really early. We had a switch and I hit a physical switch and that signal from the receiver from the VCR was going directly into the projector. There was no computer inside of there, which is why the latency was so unbelievably low. It's like, it's not even a frame or it's whatever was in the projector, right? One or two frames. So that was the other advantage of using this actual radio signal as opposed to using ethernet or Wi-Fi or whatever, yeah? Okay, so again, Loving that idea, really, that was a really nice use of that. But it was just the one little section in the piece. We didn't actually do a long, um, a long thing with it. And so, and so I wanted to use this again. And so the, the, what you're looking at now is another camera. This is a head camera that, uh, what's missing here, I don't have it anymore, is the boom. So I actually had this mounted on a wire, on a, it was actually on a, a directional microphone because there was a, also a microphone with this, but the camera was mounted on the microphone so it could see my face. Hold on, I'm seeing a uh, question. Okay, I'll come back to that. Um, and so this tiny camera, which uh, the close-up here is a little bit hard to make out, but you see this tiny little camera was attached to that boom so that it was always facing my face and you had constantly the image of my face no matter where I, where I was facing in the piece because in this piece I performed I also I, did, I wrote the music Dawn did the choreography but I also performed in this piece so that's the next thing that I'm going to show you and and the and then we projected that image on a um, uh, a six foot or four and a half foot meter and a half uh, weather balloon and so it was on this curved surface, so my face was also quite distorted because of that. You'll see that in a second. I also want to mention, um, this was direct, there was one video projector dedicated to this, uh, this weather balloon thing. And so the way that we, we couldn't turn it off, right? There was no computer in the way. So that little fuzz you see on the top right of the camera, that's actually a piece of Velcro because I had a little lens cap. So when we didn't want the image from my camera, I put the lens cap on. And when we did want it, I put the lens cap off and I touched it to the Velcro so I wouldn't lose it in the show. And it's pretty, it's pretty basic and pretty old school, but, um, but you know, it worked, right? 
Uh, I'll come back to the question right after we take a look at this. So here's the clip for that. Let me get that one. Here's the head cam clip. Again, we're in the year 2000. That's, the, that's where we're at here. This is still, as I said before, pre-Isadora. Yeah. And go here. And let me get this called up. Yep. And here we go. Factual up to this point, so I didn't know what to make of a question like that. I suppose they wanted to know about my insides, about the things going on inside of me, about the internal, secret things. It's strange. When you're being questioned like that, you know, interrogated, you remember things that you haven't thought about in a really long time. When I was about 10 years old, I had a piggy bank. Except that the bank wasn't in the shape of a pig, it was in the shape of a brain. It was made of porcelain and had a beautiful, smooth, gray glaze. I must have gotten it at some sort of science museum or something. And every nickel, penny, and dime that I got, I drop it into that bank, the brain bank. Okay, so... So that's, uh, that was the head cam, yeah? And uh, also interesting, just for a side note, uh, you see that the, the dancer, that's Lisa Herlinger Thompson, another dancer in the company at the time, she's paralleling my movement. I mean, I learned a little bit of choreography, but she has the MIDI dancer on her elbows, and all that sound that you're hearing, and also the movement of the word, which is a little hard to see, all of that was controlled by the MIDI dancer, yeah? So, but this was a nice use of this camera. What was interesting again about it was there were several parts where I was facing upstage, away from the audience. They could not see my face, so my back was to them, and yet this big face of mine was always present, and the amplified voice was also always present, yeah? Okay, so that's that. Finally, because it's like the most, I mean, for me, it's the most significant thing we do, is the MIDI dancer, yeah? This is a system that measured the movement of the joints on a dancer's body, yeah? And so I, I don't have a picture with me of MIDI Dancer version one. It's actually in a frame up in my home. Uh, but uh, this picture is taken from 1989 when I made the, the very first MIDI Dancer piece. This was a really rough combination of stuff to make it work. It wasn't very elegant. It used actual radio control car transmitters from Radio Shack, which is like Conrad's if you don't know Radio Shack. And that's what allowed me to um, send the signal. It barely worked, but somehow we got it to work. I was still a student at CalArts. But let's take a look now. This is MIDI Dancer version 2. Yeah, this is what was used for in plane. And again, you see the ubiquitous in every project 68HC11 microcontroller and another this MIDI I.O. board. And then on the left, you see, um, uh, you see the, the companion thing that goes with it, yeah? So this, you could plug in this. This would take up to eight sensors, actually. But to see that clearly, let's go ahead and go to MIDI Dancer version 3, which is what I used... Um, for the chemical wedding and also for the piece we're going to look at in a moment called Ren Rien. So this is the this is what I the most sophisticated one that I have. And so there was this receiver box, which is the silver box on the left with the antenna. The black box is the transmitter. We'll see inside that in a second. And then there were these flex sensors, and there's kind of a great story about the flex sensors. Um, you have to be my age um, uh, to remember, but uh, in the 80s at some point, like 87 maybe, I don't know, you can look it up, a thing was introduced called the, um, the Mattel Power Glove. And it was a thing that had some buttons, but also flex sensors in the fingers. And the idea was you could play your game without actually touching the buttons. You just flex your fingers like crazy and play, you know, your typical kind of computer games. Well, I thought this was amazing, and this is, I had already made the first MIDI dancer. This used actual potentiometers, like knobs, and there was a wire on the knob that you'd kind of tape to someone's arm, and by moving the, the, like this, the potentiometer turned. Well, this was super clunky, right? That wasn't the way to do it. But these flexible sensors were really cool, but nobody knew who made them. It was like really wild. And again, 
uh, not to, to age myself again, but there was no internet. I don't even remember how I found this out, but I started digging and I found out that this company in New York were the ones that made the sensors. And it was because it was kind of a big secret. They were made by Mattel and I wrote Mattel and they wouldn't tell me. So anyway, uh, <laughs> to make a long story short, I sent a, mess a, a letter to the company that manufactured these, which I had discovered by being a sleuth. And I said, I'm an artist, I am making this project, I absolutely really, really need to buy some sensors from you and please will you just sell me some, you know, just because I, I otherwise I have to like buy the power glove and tear it apart, which is what I did to get the first ones, was I actually bought the glove and ripped the sensors apart, which was not easy because they were embedded in the plastic. So I got a letter back and the letter said, we don't know how you discovered who we are, but we will make you a deal. We will sell you 200 sensors if you never tell anyone where you got them. And so I wrote back and I said, that sounds great. And they were going to cost 25 cents each, I remember. And I said, I will buy 200 from you. And that's exactly what I did. I bought 200 of them. And eventually it became more known. It wasn't a secret forever, which I think I'm not breaking my agreement by telling it now where I got them although I didn't say the name of the company. But uh, in any case, um, uh, so, so um, I got these sensors. And that was crucial for this project though because they were so much nicer than what we were using before with the original MIDI dancer, yeah? So there's a close-up of the receiver, lots of, uh, oh yeah, the important part, the other important part, if you look on the right side, you see a little silver thing kind of at an angle that is the radio transmitter. That was also super new at that moment. That was, a, um, uh, that was a radio transmitter that could send serial data, right? So like, like serial data, like RS-232, up to 9,600 9, bits per second. And so that, with the companion receiver, meant that I didn't have to try and convert the signals to analog and then convert them back. It did that for me, which was also super important. And as pointed out before, no latency because it's its own radio transmitter, it's ethernet, it's like instantaneous, right? So there's no delay whatsoever. And then just uh, one couple other close-ups here to let you see, that's the transmitter box. The little piece of foam and the thing was to protect the components from the dancers. You know, they rolled on these things, right? That was the other thing. They were designed to be super physical and they would roll on them and we had to protect the electronics inside so that they wouldn't crush it. And there's the final super close up of what was going on inside of the little transmitter. The, the board on the top right that you see, uh, just uh, to, the, yeah, to the right of the blue switches there, that's the, that transmitter unit. That's the thing that was sending the serial data in digital form, yeah? Okay, so now, this, as I said, was the most important thing to me, and this is the thing that I actually have to show you live. So here is a, box, a receiver box, just like you were just seeing. Yeah, yeah, there's all the bits. And uh, it's, uh, okay, this connector is not fitting perfectly, so I'm just gonna hold it here. But you see, there's a nice big red light there. That's because nothing is happening and you'll see what that means in a minute. So I'm gonna put the top back on, extend the antenna because it's radio, so it actually needs an antenna. So, yeah. Okay, and then over here is the MIDI dancer. Yeah, and here's the sensors. I wanna show you something that's really important. If you do anything like this in terms of your own inspiration of stuff, I don't know if you can see this, but if I get really close here, let me see. Uh, no. Yeah, it's pretty hard to see, but so, oh there, can you see that there's two pieces of cardboard sticking out from under that tape? So the whole key, and this is where Dawn was, this was her thing, strain relief. Dawn was the queen of strain relief because these things broke left and right. Our dancers could be so physical. You saw how she was in In Plane. It's a super physical piece. How do you prevent the thing from breaking during the show? But this little system of, in, uh, of putting two pieces of cardboard and then wrapping the wire like, a, like an S inside and taping it, 
that was a crucial discovery because a lot of, you know, I was going through the 200 sensors too fast. I was gonna, gonna run out. And so like that strain relief thing was Don's invention. So now um, there's a little slot on the side, kind of hard to see, but inside of there, I turn that on. Now I just turned on the power. There's a little switch inside so that the dancer can't hit the switch with their body when they're dancing. And now if you look at the receiver, if I actually plug it in, you'll see a happy blinking green light. You can't see it blinking on the video, but I, I promise you it's blinking. And so that was actually really important for the piece that I would show you next because there were four dancers wearing the MIDI dancer and I needed to have those units in front of me all the time because if one of those went red, that meant there was a dead MIDI dancer and I needed to do stuff to try and kind of fill in the blanks for one of the missing performers, right? Um, so, um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I just took a quick look at the chat there. Uh, so, yeah, so, um, I lost my train of thought. Oh my goodness. Um, anyway, uh, oh yeah, I needed to see the red light, so I instantly knew that there was a problem. So if it was all blinking green lights, yay. One red light, oh man, panic, do something, right? So this MIDI dancer actually works. And um, so now what I'll do is I'll switch the view again here and let you see Isadora and we'll go to the next scene now if you're a long time user of Isadora you might have seen this actor because a few times it accidentally went out with a release when it shouldn't have because this was always intended just to be for me privately but this is the MIDI dancer actor that uh, received the data and you can see here that the little stick figure actually moves depending now wait i have to make it so you can see me sorry i chose the wrong preset forgive me there we go there we go so here's me with the four sensors i i didn't affix them to my body it was just a little bit too difficult to do but here's the four sensors so like here's sensor number one and obviously I've got this hooked up and controlling music already as well, but as I bend this, you can see the one, the, the right arm on the little figure and the actor change. If I do number two, it's the left arm. Yeah. So, so yeah, so these would be mounted either on the wrists, the elbows, the knees or the hips. I mean, there's probably, we even tried a neck one time, wasn't very reliable because there isn't much range, but we tried these all over the place, right? And it's, um, but you know, they have a good range and you can see here that I'm, I've also got some video hooked up and I mean, I'm not really going to dissect this for you, but let's, let's listen carefully. I hope you can hear the music live and everything coming from the system sound here. But let's just take a listen to the different components. So here's sensor number one. It's kind of a beautiful bell synthy kind of thing. And right now I'm just controlling the volume. Yeah. Here's sound number two, also controlling the volume. This is more percussive and clicky. Scratchy. Number three is kind of a beautiful drone. And you see I've got a piece of video attached to that. The brightness of the video is also being controlled. Yeah. And then number four, this nice little rhythmic bit, yeah? So this, that, I mean, this is the simplest possible use of the MIDI dancer. I mean, you could also, we were using it to control the robotic motors to control the selection of video and in plane as you saw with the old laser disc player i mean you can once you've got a number as i've pointed out a million times in my guru sessions once you've got a number you can turn it into anything right but um but you know obviously if we start combining these all of them right so 
you get the idea, right? But then, just to make this a little more interesting, I also put some acceleration. I actually used the samples from the old in plane. So if I move number one really quickly, this would be like if you have your arm and you're like, Wah! like that, right? So high velocity movement gets a trigger and it, it causes a piece of video to play briefly and you hear this special sound. But if I move it slowly, it's just controlling the volume of that one sound. Yeah, same thing with number two. Oh, it's not cooperating. Oh, that's number four, that's why. Okay, there's my little hand composition. So that is, uh, that's the MIDI dancer the final version of the MIDI dancer, yeah? Which, uh, you know, Don and I made a promise to each other when we started working with this that we would keep working with it for at least 10 years to try to discover everything we could discover about it because we felt like people would grab onto a technology, use it up, get some publicity for it, and they'd dump it in the trash. But we really wanted to see what this instrument could do, and I'm proud to say that we did it even longer than 10 years. We kept investigating this and seeing how we could use this for music, robotic control, you know, everything that you've seen today. One other little charming factor, you can see this one has a name. It's called Huey. Um, the story behind that, because there's four of them and they all have names. And the reason is it was very important that the right dancer got the right one, right? Because I depended that Sandy had Huey and Lisa had Dewey and Mishu had Louie, etc. right? I needed to know that the right dancer had the right one, otherwise, my whole patch would be messed up. So it was super important that they were named. But the story behind the names is that if you've never seen it, there's a wonderful film from like 1975 called Silent Running starring Bruce Dern. In that very apocryphal movie, the world has, the pollution has gotten so bad that no plants can live on Earth anymore and they have a biosphere in outer space where they're saving the last surviving plants, kind of like a Noah's Ark kind of thing. And his only companions, Bruce Dern's only companions, are three robots, which he names Huey, Dewey, and Louie. But the problem was, that was great for the first three names, but we needed names for the other one. And that actually comes, embarrassingly, I guess, from an episode of Gilligan's Island, where a, a band crashes, the, a, a pop band crashes on the island. They're really like, they're supposed to be the Beatles, but they couldn't, of course, say the Beatles. But the names of the band members are Bingo, Bango, Bongo, and Irving. So the fourth MIDI dancer is also called Irving. So it's Huey, Dewey, Louie, and Irving. So, okay, that's just a little story about the naming. But the point, of, the real point of the story was we identified these with names, which was handy because it was just if, one, if, if a dancer didn't have the right MIDI dancer on, the whole piece wouldn't work. So it was very important. They always used the same one. They knew which one they were supposed to use and that's what they wore. Okay, so I see a question. Is the MIDI dancer available on the market? No, because it's all handmade. You see that this stuff is like, I made it myself, you know, and just like, uh, but I mean, these days with an Arduino, it wouldn't be hard to make, make a MIDI dancer again, I would think. Um, so, because uh, I, I think with an Arduino also, you could program it in languages, excuse me, more convenient than assembler, yeah? Um, let me see if there's any other questions. Okay, so, uh, oh goodness, I have to go back, to zoom through the slideshow, because I, MIDI dancer, la la la. Oh, yeah, I, ah, shucks. Okay, I, I wanted to show, let me go back to the, the screen capture stuff here. Hold on. Yeah, so this is the actual MIDI dancer costume for InPlane. 
the costume was actually like a sandwich. Like you see that there's an outer layer that's kind of silver, but there's an inner layer and the wires were all going through this. We wanted, we told the costume designer, we want to see as much skin as possible because we want it to be human, but yet the outer part should feel metallic because it was again, this conflict between the human dawn and the virtual dawn or the whatever you want to call it. But along with that, you also see this blue uh, case that went with us everywhere, the MIDI Dancer Support Kick, which had pieces of cardboard for strain relief, extra sensors, solder, a small soldering iron, and everything we needed to repair them because there would always be some, we'd, every show I'd have to replace some of the sensors because they would break. Oh, I forgot to say that. That was the other thing about the sensors. Well, we'll actually come to this. I want you to look at the little brown strips of neoprene that you see there and I think you'll see this in the next image too. Um, is this right? I'm sorry I'm gonna to have to go yeah here we go. So you see these neoprene sleeves those were super important too if you decide to work with these flex sensors please copy this design again this is all Dawn's doing but those neoprene we just got eighth inch neoprene we made a little sleeve and hot glued it together and slipped the uh, sensor inside. Why? Because if you ever got a crease, like you could see an angle in the sensor, that was it. Totally dead, useless, could never use it again. And you really needed to prevent that. And this neoprene, uh, especially for the elbow, because the elbow you can really make a crease if you really close it. But these neoprene sleeves kept it so that there was enough of a curve that they wouldn't be destroyed by just flexing, right? And so on the left, on the left and far left and far left are ones for the knees. These were actually knee pads. The, in the dance community in those days, they were referred to um, as Chinese knee pads, I think, because they actually came from China. They were very thin knee pads that you could wear under a costume without ruining the line, but these were great for putting the sensors on. And then in the, in the going in from that, were ones for the elbows. You'll see that they're inside out right now so you can see this little sleeve. And then the final one is one that was made for the wrist. So if I go forward a slide here, something's kind of wrong with my slideshow. Maybe I went too fast. But anyway, there it is. So you see the ones on the left, that's leg and elbow, and also on the right is le from the outside leg and elbow. And the other one was that band Velcroed around your wrist and the, and the neoprene thing was like this so that you could do this on the wrist. I see some questions. Um, uh, will there be another Verkstadt soon? Off topic, but uh, it will not, we, we're still figuring that out, right? Um, obviously it's not happening this summer and just stay tuned. We, we definitely want to bring the community together, together again, but you know, the Verkstadt is expensive and you know, we, we never actually make any money on it. Um, and so, you know, as you can imagine, the pandemic's been tricky from those standpoints. So there's a lot for us to consider about how we would do it and why and everything. So it's on our radar. We will let you know as soon as we know. And then the other question, um, <laughs> sensor kill. Did you use the inner or outer part of the joint? It's, uh, it was on the, it was in the inside of the elbow, on the outside of the knee. Uh, it was on this part of the wrist, this side. Sorry, I bumped my microphone, forgive me. And on the hips, it was like in front of your hips. Like, so if it was your hips, it was down here, yeah? So that answers that question. All right, so. But these designs, again, Don, someone said something about trial and error. This was the most trial and error. I mean, also the electronics and get it working. There was a lot of trial and error there too. But getting, because these were only tested when the dancers put them on and they failed. So, you know, I could do the electronics at home and kind of make sure it was working, but you had to work with these things in situ. Like that's how you found out if they were working and if they broke everything and if what you had to do it. So really, uh, Don, while being a great choreographer, was actually a great industrial designer that created all of these systems for us to make it work. All right, I wanna go through my, my slideshow was being weird. Yeah, I gotta go through it one more time because it looks, I have to go a little bit slower. So while I'm slowly going through the slideshow to get to the slide I need to be at, I should have programmed it so I could start anywhere. Um, 
I just want to say, um, I really, it's so nice to bring everyone back together again, you know, bringing the people together during the pandemic was so special because none of us had any place to go. And I'd be curious to see actually how many people came today because now people actually have jobs and have to go to work and may or may not be able to come for the live sessions. But it feels really good to be back doing this again. And like I said, we're really making a commitment in the coming year to do more guru sessions and to you know, kind of ramp that back up and also be a lot of other content coming from Professor Woland. Is, there's some stuff coming up and also from Ryan, who you all know. So the final bit of this talk, just very briefly, miscellaneous weird stuff, okay? So um, this is just some stuff that, um, that I just felt like showing because it's, it's something funny or cute about it or whatever. So the first one is this stereo optagon that I made. It's not real, obviously. It's just a piece of plexiglass and some wood, and the, the little hood is pretty bent up by now, but I, I wanted to document this. I also performed in Vera's body, and I make a, a whole speech where I look into the life of this character, Vera, by putting slices of bread into the front part of that, and I'm looking at it and saying all this stuff as if the slice of bread is an actual slide. And... Um, Anyway, that's not technological at all, but that was just one of the devices when I was with Don last week that we photographed that was kind of special to me because there was this whole theme, the bread, the idea of bread, body, bread, you know, there's also a religious connotation there, ran through the whole show. And in fact, in the very last moments, it was a timer went off and we had a bread maker that was making bread under the stage. So the aroma of fresh baked bread was coming into the audience as we came to the end of the piece. So anyway, not technology, just something special to me. Now, this is really fun. So in, in um, Future of Memory, ping pong balls play a big role. And I am embarrassed to say, and I asked Dawn, and she doesn't remember either, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't remember why this was dramaturgically critical. I'm sure it was because we never did anything unless there was a dramaturgical reason to do it. But I really don't remember why this was important. But the main point is, and I found the point on the video, but you really can't, um, you can't see it, unfortunately. You can't see the ping pong, ping pong ball drop. But we just wanted this ping pong ball to fall from the sky because there's a lot of ping pong balls that they're handling in the piece. But we just wanted it as a surprise because the sound is great when it goes, dong, 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 right? So, and this was as simple as can be. Uh, there's a solenoid, that's the blue thing, and you see this little piece of wire. The piece of wire prevented the ping pong ball from falling out. And this was attached to a power supply. And so to make the solenoid open up, this was, this was, there was no computer involved. This was, uh, power supply was plugged into a non-dim uh, dimmer, you know, one that just turns on and off. And the light board, she just had a thing in the light board that pulsed it really fast to make the solenoid go tick, like that, and a ball would drop out like that. And here's a close-up of the solenoid. So I just love that everything was made out of wood and black, you know, gaffer tape. And yeah, you see how, how simply we did this stuff way back then. This was in the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. This has another 6080C11. I, I was disappointed that I couldn't get this working in Portland. Um, we, there was a, in the book, The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, which we based the piece on, there's this scene where there are these like, points of light float, floating in the sky. And we wanted to duplicate that. So we made several of these objects. Each of these wires at the end has a small incandescent light. And the circuit board at the bottom actually receives, it's not specific infrared data, but any infrared remote. If you pointed it at the thing and pushed the button, the actual serial data coming out of the, of the uh, infrared remote would be red and cause the lights to blink in a beautiful pattern, yeah? And so these were brought on stage. You see there's a string, there's a black piece of um, string there, and they would ritualistically drag these out, and then her lighting designer from the booth would be like brrr, pressing the infrared remote to get all the lights to blink in a beautiful way. But we wanted them to be wireless so that they could just be brought onto the stage and then be taken off. So that was actually a kind of a beautiful device. And um, I might be at the end here. Let me actually look. Yeah, this is the last slide. Just for any of you teaching, if any of you are doing any teaching. So Don and I were invited to teach a lot in the early days of our career. And we wanted to work with sensors, but you know, it was like we couldn't, 
afford to get MIDI dancers for a uh, you know, class of 30. So one of the things that, one of the solutions we came up with is this little setup. So the silver, the round circular thing is called an iMic, but it's the same as anything you can get today. It's an audio interface, right? So uh, it just has a stereo microphone input. But attached to that is a splitter to take the stereo and turn it into two mono eighth inch plugs. And then attached to that, you can see we've got an eighth inch phone plug and a piezo sensor. This is something you can get for a dollar. Uh, you can order it online or whatever, but it, it's a little sensor. It's actually the thing usually that makes sound in things like cell, old cell phones and things like that. But it is also a microphone. So by soldering the wires to both sides of the piezo, running that wire into the microphone, you had a two-channel sensor. And the way that that worked was, in Isadora, you would simply use the sound level watcher, the sound input, you'd use this device, and you had two channels where you could like tap it and you could get a trigger based on that. And so that was a way for the students to be able to have a little something that they could touch and trigger things in response to this. Now, I've seen this actually used in other situations and um, we had a gig one time in Cleveland at a big arts festival and someone had done a piece using Isadora where they took these kind of piezos using the same kind of system, taped the piezo to a, the glass in a storefront wall so that people coming by could tap the glass and cause it to change from one scene to another, right? So that was um, one use of this. But in terms of a super cheap interface to have some kind of tactile way of controlling something, this is about as cheap as you can get. This is the cheapest thing. And I'll just add uh, a wonderful student in a workshop, really early, early days uh, from Brazil called Ludmilla, oh, I forget her last name, or I don't want to say it wrong. I'm, um, but anyway, Ludmilla, came to New York, spent every cent she had to fly to take a workshop with us, and she really wanted a wireless sensor, but you know, she also didn't have a lot of money. She went down to Canal Street in New York and found the crappiest uh, wireless guitar transmitter she could ever find, and then made her, she soldered it herself and created a piezo into that so she could wear it on her belt, and she took, put the piezo on her chest so that she could dance and tap the piezo to cause things to happen in Isadora. And it was like, I think the whole thing cost her $10. Uh, you would never use this guitar transmitter for a guitar because it would sound terrible. But for this purpose, it totally worked. And so I always remember that because she was so innovative because she absolutely had no money and that was the way she solved the problem. So, okay, that is the Dance Tech Archaeology session. We got all the way to the end. So, I hope that was interesting for you. Uh, I can tell you for Dawn and I, it was quite nostalgic to go through all of this stuff that we made together, that you know we conceived together and that we built with our own two hands and that were used in so many of our pieces. And so it's great that we now have this documentation and we'll be writing stuff about these, some of the things that you heard today, and putting that on our website so that for whatever, for posterity, yeah? And um, like I said, I will, uh, I hopefully Don won't get mad at me for making this offer, but if you have someone in Portland and if you want the stepper motor controllers or some of these devices, by the way, if you're watching this as recorded, they're gone already because someone asked, I'm sure. But if you're watching this live and you want those things, and if you have someone in Portland, Oregon, who can pick it up without requiring any trans, you know, shipping uh, or effort, then we could probably work something out. And it would be make me happy to know that it went to some sort of Isadora home, yeah? So I'm gonna look at this chat for one last question to see if there's any other lingering things before we get to the very end. Okay, I don't see any further questions, so thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Don Stapiello who what, couldn't be with us today, but is with us in spirit because this is not just me, it's both of us. It, this is what we created together and I really need to emphasize that. And, but as you can see, oh wait, I'll close. I'm sorry, I wanna close with one thing. There was one last link because I didn't play it. Let's see the actual, a little bit of the actual MIDI Dancer Quartet um, called Ren. I'm going to put two links in. I, admit, I also skipped a different MIDI dancer thing, but we're running out of time. So I'll just quickly, so you can go look at this one. The first link you can just go look at later. And then the second link, I'll just play a little bit.
of this one because this is the only piece really where there were four dancers dancing at the same time all of whom were wearing the midi dancer this is the thing why i made the little figure that i was talking about so we'll conclude with a little bit of this and let me switch views again okay and play <laughs> Okay, so um, that, uh, let's see, is it me? Yes. Uh, that was just a small excerpt. You should really watch the, the whole piece because um, that, was a, that was a piece that was very interesting and don't, I don't want to end this on a downer, but, um, a, but you know, that piece was really about community, about having a community, being part of a community. And it was very interesting. It was the first time that Troika Ranch ever got to play two weekends. It was the first time we had three days and then a break in three days. And what happened in the middle of those two three-day uh, performances? September 11th. And we had to make a decision about whether to perform that piece. And the way that that piece's meaning changed after watching the Trade Center come down and coming back and deciding to perform and 10 people came. 10 people were in that audience, but that was a really special night. And that, that music that you just heard and you see that that video of them going away at the four dancers, this was a piece about community and the fact that it happened at the moment of this event when I saw the community of New York come together like I never saw it in my whole life. That was kind of an amazing experience, I have to tell you. So anyway, um, that's Ren Rien and I don't, you know, there's, it's like, and that's also the very first piece where Isadora was used, right? That's 2001, and now we're actually able to control video and control the music, and everything is being done with Isadora. So that's also the moment when Isadora comes to life for Troika Ranch, because two years later, I start selling it, and somehow, here we are today. <laughs> so, okay, that is the end of my presentation. Let me see... La la la, no final questions. Okay, so um, thanks a lot for coming. Really great to be back with you again. There's gonna be more coming up. You're gonna see some stuff, like I said, coming from Professor Woland and from Ryan, our DUSX, as you know him on the forum. So keep on making art, and I hope to see you all really, really soon. Bye-bye for now.